What is dark matter? This is one of the great mysteries of our age, and astronomers have been searching for evidence for like close to 100 years to try and figure out what this is. What is this extra mass or strange gravity that seems to exist here in the universe? And finally, there's a whole bunch of amazing observatories, both on the ground and in space that are coming online that are going to be able to help us get an answer to this puzzling question. My guest today is Christian Aganze. He is a postdoctoral scholar at Stanford University and has a really clever idea for how we could detect the presence of blobs of dark matter that are orbiting around the Milky Way. All right, here's the interview. Christian, what's it like spending this time thinking about this telescope that is still a couple of years away? Uh, are you having trouble, you know, sort of uh, being patient enough? Hi, Fraser. Thank you for inviting me here. Yeah, I am excited about the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope uh, that's going to launch probably in 2027. Um, and um, I'm uh, I guess excited and I can't wait for it to be out there taking data. Uh, I am, I guess the emotion is just excitement and just wait uh, until the next, you know, uh, three, three to four years. Hopefully it's on schedule and we can start uh, getting some really good data. I think about the people who were there when, say, James Webb was being developed more than 20 years ago and the amount of time they've had to wait to finally get their hands on this telescope. So it's it's been a long time, but not quite as long as that. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, I think people started working on JWST. Like the idea was there even in the 90s, right? Yeah. So, I can imagine they had to wait a long time for this thing to fly. Yeah. And it's been an amazing instrument. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, Nancy Grace Roman has a whole bunch of tasks that it's going to be able to do. Your work recently was to think about how this telescope is going to help give us more precision on how we see dark matter in, in the universe. So, can you give me a, a sense, like in your field specifically, what is the state of the art for being able to figure out where the dark matter is clumping and where it isn't? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I can try to uh, at least summarize what we at least you know about dark matter. Um, at least for for the work that's related to my work, meaning people that are using stellar streams to actually map these small clumps of dark matter, uh, the state of the art is really using Milky Way streams. Uh, so there's some work by uh, Anna Bonassa and others where they've shown that um, uh, gaps in streams, in global class streams, can help us actually understand uh, dark matter. There's been a lot of simulations in this field. Um, so people just simulating what the signature will look like. Uh, and then we're trying to use some higher um, uh, statistical tools, uh, like, uh, like things like simulation based inference to actually map uh, what we observe in these streams to dark matter substructure. Uh, but just dark matter in general, there's a lot of work being done in lensing uh, where people can constrain the uh, mass of this. Uh, and also just looking at uh, dwarf galaxies around the Milky Way has also been a huge, uh, huge field and lots of people working in those areas. But so, so help me understand this idea of seeing the effect of, I guess, the signal of dark matter in these streams. So, so what are these streams that you are studying around the Milky Way? What, what, what causes them? Yeah, so streams are these uh, tidal features around uh, either galaxies, small galaxies, uh, or globular clusters. And they're caused by just a disruption, uh, a tidal disruption. So you have a spherical cluster that's orbiting a much bigger galaxy. And as the cluster orbits, you get stars that are getting ripped off that cluster. Uh, and they're kind of trailing the cluster, or also some of them are in forward motion, depending on where they were when they did this, when they disturb, when they are removed from the cluster. Uh, so you have these long tails that we, have, we can actually see um, in, in global clusters in the Milky Way. Um, and some extragalactic streams have also been detected. And, and so these yeah. stars are being kind of plucked away one by one by the gravity of the more massive galaxy 
and it's stripping away these stars from this this globular cluster. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, that's that's what's happening. Yeah. And it's not the opposite. It's not like the cluster isn't pulling stars away from the galaxy, following it like a tail. No, yeah, it's the stars from the smaller galaxy. That's the smaller mass that's being pulled away by the bigger, the bigger mass. Yeah. And and do we see these tails, these streams coming from all? Like I know we have all of these globular clusters that are above and below the galactic halo. They're in this kind of cloud around the galaxy. Do we? Is there one of these associated with pretty much every single cluster around the Milky Way? Not every single cluster. We haven't detected them around every single cluster, but we know around 100 streams in the Milky Way, something like that. Oh, wow. That. Uh, yeah, and uh, most of them are, are from global clusters, but we have some satellite galaxies also that were disrupted that show this uh, type of features around them. Uh, so they're pretty common. Uh, we can see them, uh, but not every, uh, depending on the cluster, so like what is the size, the mass of the cluster, what's, what its orbit in the Milky Way, uh, you can have... Um, Classes that don't show actually the signature of disruption, um, uh, but eventually, uh, yeah, that's 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 what happened as you orbit the Milky Way so many times. Yeah, and so you know, let's imagine that the Milky Way didn't have any dark matter associated with it. I mean, I guess the Milky Way would tear itself apart from its rotation, but let's say that it didn't. Um, what is different between the movement of the Milky Way and these stars around it versus you know this ten times more massive? dark matter halo that surrounds the Milky Way. What is the what is the difference that you're looking that that you're you would be able to see now? Yes, yeah. So the dark matter has two things. One it's uh it's the extra mass, so you get uh more potential. So you you you, you get a different disruption. Um but also the shape of the dark matter profile is different from the stars. So you can also uh that's also something that dark matter adds to something like the Milky Way. And and so then, I guess, how do you use it as a probe for the actual shape? Is that even a way to describe it? The yes, shape of the dark yeah. matter halo around the Milky Way? Yeah, so people have done work trying to map the shape of the Milky Way halo uh, and also actually mapping uh, shapes of external galaxies by just looking at these streams in other galaxies. So that work has been done. And most of it is really modeling. Is there is They assume some kind of analytical a model for the potential of the Milky Way or the other galaxy. And then they try to fit for the parameters and based, given the orbit of the stream that they're observing. And that that does a pretty good job. Um, and is is that because the speed of these is very slow? You can you can take, say, the radio velocity of of each star, but it's a snapshot in time. And you it's not like you're able to watch an entire orbit and trace its motion beautifully across for the however tens of millions yeah, of years it yeah. would take to go around. Yeah, yeah. So the nice thing about these streams is that roughly all these tidal disruptions, uh, disrupted stars, kind of tend to, to follow the orbit of the stream. Uh, so you, you're kind of getting like a resolution in orbit that you wouldn't get if you just had one star. Uh, so you have a bunch of stars that are actually distributed along that orbit, and you can actually uh, map uh, orbits much better if you have streams. Um, yeah. And so based on our understanding today, what is the shape of the Milky Way's dark matter halo? Yeah, so uh, based on our understanding, uh, the shape of the Milky Way dark matter halo, it's mostly some kind of, uh, we have a bunch of models that people assume, but it's it's uh, sorry, it's something like a spherical, spherical mass, and there's uh, debates whether it flattens at the center of the Milky Way. Um, and, it, it, and I guess, I mean, we'll get into how Nancy Grace Roman will, will help with this. But so, I mean, the Milky Way itself is this flattened disk. And so the, the halo is definitely not a flattened disk that roughly matches the shape of the Milky Way, right? It is yeah, yeah. more spherical. Yeah, the halo, uh, the stellar halo and the dark matter halo are these spherical uh, structures. And we, we know this because we know that uh, uh, halos form by, so galaxies form by eating... Uh, smaller galaxies, and these smaller galaxies have uh, randomly oriented orbits. So if you take a bunch of randomly oriented things and you put them together, you eventually get something that looks roughly spherical. Right, right. Okay, okay. Um, okay, and so like your sort of as you look today and you think about this this work, 
you know, what is the sort of, and we talked about this earlier, like the state of the art, like, like what were you able to determine with the kinds of observations, with the kinds of telescopes that you have access to right now about this? About the Mercury halo or just- Yeah, about, uh, about, yeah. The, the, about the streams of stars, about the motions of the, of the clusters, you know, is there like a level of precision? Like, like I'm sort yeah, of imagining yeah. like, you know, Sigma, if there's a way yeah. to describe that, right? Like, yeah, like yeah. here's how good, here's how confident you are with the kinds of observations you've made so far. Yeah. So um, with this small uh, globular cluster streams, which is what this paper was about, um, well, as a, if we go back to that story where stars are being tidally uh, stripped from uh, their cluster, and they are kind of following the orbit of the stream. Occasionally, you will get like a dark matter subhalo. This is not the big Milky Way halo. This is a small dark matter clump that passes through the stream and usually leaves a gap. And that gap has actually been seen in some Milky Way streams. For instance, there's a stream called GD1 that has a gap that can only that can be reproduced by that kind of a modeling. So the, the 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 gap the size of the gap depends on the mass of the subhalo that passes through it so if you have a much bigger subhalo uh, you create a much bigger gap and well, one thing that can be constrained is the you know the mass of the subhalo so we think uh, so uh, the other method of so what this method uh, gives as an advantage is being to probe much smaller dark matter halos. So things like 10 to the six, 10 to the seven solar masses. Uh, these are small things that uh, they have, if you were to look at uh, what we think about galaxy formation is that uh, these small things are 10 to the six, 10 to the seven solar mass subhalos tend to not have any stars around them. So they don't actually form many galaxies that you can see. They don't have any luminous stars around them. Uh, so people that do like, uh, you know, counting how many dwarf galaxies we have around the Milky Way. They look at things that have stars, or you need to see the, the, the cluster. Uh, but these dark matter subhalos from 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 solar masses uh, don't have any stars. Um, and since they don't have any stars, they, um, you know, this is one way of seeing them. Uh, it's just seeing this uh, disruption of a stream that leaves a gap. And then you can infer that, okay, this is, this looks like roughly the mass of the subhalo that passes through the stream. And so like 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7, th that's like the mass of a globular cluster. Yeah. So in this case, we're thinking about globular clusters that have masses of 10 to the 5, something like that. Yeah. So that's, right. uh, yeah, the masses tend to, I guess, in that case, you, you start to think about global cluster size subhalo, but right. this is a dark matter. But yeah. not like full dwarf galaxy, definitely not galaxy. So there are blobs of mm. dark matter with yeah. roughly the mass of a dwarf galaxy, somewhere between a globular cluster and a dwarf galaxy That's that right. are yeah. orbiting around the Milky Way, invisible, except for when they pass through one of these streams of stars, disrupting it in a way that you can kind of watch its wake as yeah. it passes through. Yeah. Um, do, do we have a sense of, you know, for the, for the amount of these passages that you've detected, do we have a sense of how many of them there are out there compared to, say, the dwarf galaxies that surround the Milky Way? Yeah. So how many of them should we expect? It's an interesting um, question, scientifically. And there are many people who do modeling. So they have these dark matter simulations that make big galaxies and they... and in these models in core dark matter, um, the you can have a dark matter subhalo to you know that has any mass always down to like uh, Earth mass. So you have this spectrum of masses, uh, and then what these models try to predict is how many of them do you expect per mass, and that's called the dark matter uh, mass function or dark matter subhalo mass function. I think that's the term that people use. Uh, and different models actually predict different level of abundance of these small things. And one way to constrain those things is to just count how many of them we will see through these streams. Uh, but so far, one really, we only have a few uh, cases in the Milky Way, really like less than 10, where we can actually say um, it's likely that this gap that we see in this stream was caused by a dark matter subhalo. But we expect that there are probably a lot more out there. So we need to find more streams in the Milky Way for in other galaxies to actually uh, basically count how many gaps we see, and then we can actually constrain models. 
For instance, some um, some models that are not called dark matter predict that there shouldn't be any subhalos around these like 10 to the 6, 10 to the uh, 7 solar masses. So if we can find them, that's actually kind of ruling out these these models. Things uh, like, say, MOND, like things like modified Newtonian dynamics. No, these are dark matter models that don't predict anything be- that's a clump below uh, 10 to the 7. Or oh, okay, I see, I see. So, yeah. I, mean, I mean, I don't think MOND gives you blobs of dark matter moving through orbiting around galaxies either like i no, think no, yeah. if you find yeah. these and map them then you're already ruling out a whole bunch of alternative theories of of dark matter yes yes but in this case yeah. as you're saying like like particle size cross section things like that you start to rule out yeah 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 Right. I understand. Um, all right. So let's move to the fun part then. Um, we sort of set the stage here for the kinds of observations that you're trying to do. Let's talk about what Nancy Grace Roman brings to the table when it launches in just a couple of years. Yeah. So the Nancy Grace Roman telescope is exciting because of its large field of view. So it's going to take these huge images uh, by, uh, so it's because, it, you know, like one Roman image will be like 400 Hubble's which is insane. So we're going to use, so having a, like these large images makes you, makes it easier to map like halos of galaxies. So you, you can map halos of the Milky Way, not the Milky Way, but in this case, we're talking about external galaxies like Andromeda, uh, which was the, the test case in our, in our paper. So Andromeda and other galaxies, nearby galaxies. So you can map them really fast because you're taking these huge images that are as sensitive or even more sensitive than Hubble. Uh, but they're huge. Like one image of Roman is almost 400 images of Hubble. Right, right. And so, and so you're going to be able to very quickly build up these images at a high enough resolution that you can actually see those globular clusters orbiting around other galaxies. Yes, and even yes. their streams of stars around yeah. them with Roman. Yeah, even the, well, even better the gaps in those streams, which right you can then count. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So it's super exciting. Uh, so the, the paper here, the, the, the point where we're trying to see if this is actually feasible at first uh, before we say we can do it. So uh, the paper was trying to make predictions on uh, if this is actually even observable, given the sensitivity and the uh, of Roman. And so what kind of a volume, what kind of sphere radius do you think you'll be able to reach out to to be able to see these gaps in the streams? Yeah, in this paper, we do... Uh, we assume just if you're just exposing for one hour uh, and we don't go beyond that. And we think with just one hour exposure, so you take an image for one hour, um, you should be able to get something like uh, three megaparsec in volume, uh, which is not huge. So you get some, you, you definitely map everything in Andromeda, uh, which is exciting. And you should be able to maybe see some nearby galaxies that are a little bit smaller than Andromeda. Um, right. That gets you like triangulum as well, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and do you, like do you think that's the limit or do you think like, do, is it just Andromeda and maybe Triangulum or do you think with more time? Yes. Yeah. How you far can imagine, could you go? Yeah. If you can imagine if you have more time, uh, you can go further and you can stack different images uh, and then get deeper uh, imaging depth. But in this case, we're just saying, let's go with the simplest case. You have one hour. Uh, let's try to, what galaxies can you map halos for? Uh, and we actually didn't even know if this was possible in Andromeda uh, because Andromeda is our near, the nearest galaxy, and uh, people have done like um, there people have done this kind of mapping actually with Hubble. People have tried to map like the disk of Andromeda, um, the the hill of Andromeda, but that took a long time. That was a long proposal. Um, at least I forgot how many hours, but lots of hours. But you you can do the same kind of science by dividing the time you need by a factor of four hundred, which is huge and it's actually deeper than than Hubble so that's 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 exciting um, yeah i mean this idea that like hubble is showing you this tiny little piece of the sky it's very sensitive but yeah. it's 1 400th the field of view and capability of Nancy Grace Roman yeah so you you need many images to even take a single picture of andromeda yeah yeah Nancy Grace yeah. Roman it's lost in a sea of stars around it in one picture it's one hour yeah, and you get all of this, and yeah. so you're going to get this picture back, and you're and it and you know Andromeda is a more massive galaxy than the Milky Way. So does that does it have more clusters? Does this make your job easier? Yeah, so this makes it easier um, because you have 
So the reason, okay, we didn't do the Milky Way because, you know, Milky Way, it's kind of hard to do actually. For this kind of imaging survey where we're just looking at the uh, density contrast between those stars and the, um, and the background, you actually want to look at some external galaxies. Um, so the question was if, uh, you know, it makes it our job easier. We think, yeah, that's, there are probably something like hundreds of global clusters in Andromeda, um, at least maybe 400 and, or more. Uh, and then you can, you can imagine how many of them will have disruptions. Uh, we, so the, the thing is we have not actually seen any stream from a global cluster in Andromeda yet. Uh, people have found streams from, uh, there's a bunch of streams in Andromeda. One of them is probably from a huge merger that happened. Uh, and there's other smaller stream probably from dwarf galaxies, but there hasn't been any confirmation of global cluster stream in Andromeda because uh, the images are just not deep enough to actually see these small type of features uh, around global clusters. But we think with Roman, that question should be resolved. You should be able to see global cluster. And this is some work, uh, global cluster streams. And this work that was done by Sarah Pearson. Uh, so it was, this was kind of the work before this paper. We're trying to see if now that we know we can see streams, uh, from global classes, um, from this paper, can we see gaps in those streams? Um, which was another, another thing. And it's interesting because, I mean, this isn't exactly how Nancy Grace Roman is expected to m search for dark matter in the universe, right? Yeah. It's going to be looking at the larger scale, mapping all of the galaxies, watching yeah. all of their interactions. But in this case, you're using that wide field of view, that deep view in one galaxy nearby to do a different way of searching for dark matter, which is, you know, very clever. Yeah. Yeah. You're correct. The, most of what they want to do is just map the large scale structure by, by getting all these galaxies. Uh, but ours is just focusing on the small scales around a nearby galaxy, uh, which are complementary. Uh, so you want to concern the large scales and the small scales as well. So then, you know, I'm, you're, more of an observer than a theorist. Um, That's right, yeah. So, but if you do make observations about how big these gaps are in the streams, what conclusions do you think the theorists will be able to draw from, from what you're seeing as they think about models of dark matter? Yeah, so this is where a lot of work needs to get done uh, uh, in theory, um, because it's uh, actually not clear um, if you see a gap how do you directly map that to um, um, to a mass? So there's no like a, an analytical formula you can plug in. They say that uh, you know a gap of three kpc means a mass of um, you know <laughs> ten to the seven solar masses. No, it's because there are so many degeneracies. So you can imagine that uh, uh, depending on how slow the dark matter subhalo is moving when it crosses the stream, you get a different gap size when it. It, it hits the stream. So if this happened like 10 giga years ago or five giga years ago, the gap actually grows. Uh, so you get, you get it, you know, cause the star keep moving, uh, yep, but yep, it, yep. they've been disrupted. Yeah, I think so of like this, the wake of like an airplane contrails, it sort of expands over time, yeah, depending on how long the airplane was here. Yeah, that's a great analogy, yeah. So you can imagine that it's uh, it's not very easy to actually map the the gaps that you see to, um, to a simple, um, estimate of the dark matter mass that that caused that. That's one problem. The other problem is you actually can create the same kind of gaps by having something else like a global cluster, another global cluster that passes through the stream. Uh, if the stream is, or if you know there's an interaction of a spiral arm, anything that kind of disrupts the stream can cause some kind of gap signature. And these gap signatures are not uh, just a gap. Sometimes they look like some under density, some funny looking under density. So there's so many degeneracies uh, between um, what you observe and what you actually can predict. Uh, but we think you can actually, uh, if you have a lot of observations of these gaps, um, you can put all this into a simulation. Uh, so this technique is called a simulation-based inference. So you take all the thing you put into a simulator, and then you can estimate how likely that this is actually caused by a dark matter hill of a given mass and so forth. So people uh, do this for all kinds of problems in, in, in astronomy where you have so many parameters that you can't really track the, uh, the probability that this, uh, the likelihood. But, but it is interesting though, is if you make these observations at a more local level, the people who are working on the, on the various models to try and explain things at the largest scale, 
you can say, but you got to make it match this model as well. You got to make, it's got to match these observations, both at the largest scale, but also at this more local scale of what we see. Like, and the more situations that these models have to explain, the more, I guess, certain you can be if they do come up with something that, that explains everything. Yeah, yeah, that's exciting. So if they can explain the small scales and the large scales, then we can be confident that these models are probably right. correct. Yeah. And even give you new predictions to say, yes. oh, and by yeah. the way, if you look over to your left, you're going to notice this. Yeah, yeah. And you yeah. do, then that's yeah. even more exciting. Yeah, that's exciting. So one thing that I'm currently working on is trying to uh, simulate these things. So you can have, uh, there's people that are working on large-scale simulations, and we can actually uh, trying to use those to uh, simulate maybe what Roman or other telescopes will see as well. Yeah. So, uh, but the, the the space, you know, getting to this like low resolution or at a scale of global class stream has now been achieved in this large scale simulation that people usually do. So there's a lot of people that work on galaxy formation models, um, but just because these scales are so small, it's very hard to resolve them. So we use very simple, I guess, toy models to actually reproduce them. But it does sound to me like the tool that you probably really need to use is JWST, that to accurately map the distances between these stars in the streams, JWST, will they, once you've identified all the streams, right, yeah. then follow on observations specifically, sounds like that's exactly what it would be good for. Yeah, that would be exciting. So JWST, uh, which you know has almost uh, not the same level in French, but it covers the infrared and Roman covers the infrared. In this case, we're doing something like a, a Z, which is around like 0.9 micron. Um, but yeah, you should be able to uh, to go around the gap or around the stream with JWST, which is a much smaller field uh, than Roman. But you can imagine like uh, you know, you've seen a gap, and then you can probably map with a better resolution of JWST. Um, and that can probably give you more, more constraints on what the nature of this under density or gap is. It, it is a strange idea to think that we are being orbited by these blobs of dark matter that, that are not connected to any kind of, of galaxy. Do you think that, that they were stripped of their stars and gas by some interaction or were they just formed the way, however they formed in the Milky Way in there or in the universe, and they've just been floating around ever since? Is there a way to tell? Yeah, so uh, I'm not an expert on this, but there is the most of these small uh, dark matter halos actually formed uh, um, earlier. Uh, just they just have enough because they're so small, their potentials was not uh, uh, huge to actually retain stars when the universe was a little bit much hotter. Uh, so this is actually how you get the small dark matter sub halos. And then as the universe gets older, they merge into big halos. So you, you, galaxies that you form by, you know, this merging of small halos into bigger halos. Um, so this is also true for these dark matter halos. And they're actually bound to some galaxy. It, in this case, for the Milky Way, they'll be bound to the Milky Way. For Andromeda, they'll be bound to Andromeda and so forth. So you have usually have this like big dark matter and then it has smaller sub hills around it in these simulations. Um, oh. Yeah. Right. And, and I mean, there have been very recently the discovery of like small clouds of, of gas that were too far away from other regions of star formation that they it never triggered star formation in them. And so I, I can sort of imagine this sort of ladder of of kinds of objects, like at the, at the smallest size, you've got this tiny dark matter halo that, that doesn't can't even draw enough gas into it to begin the star formation process, and then a little more massive than that, and you can get some gas, but maybe it doesn't actually form any stars. And then larger than that, you can start to get these stars forming, but, the, but like the building block of the universe are these halos of dark matter out there. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's a good, that's a good way to put it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, Christian, what are you obsessed with right now? Right now, I'm obsessed with this big telescope that are coming up. We talked about Roman. Uh, I'm excited about Euclid, which launched in July. Uh, this is the European Space Telescope. That's uh, super great. Uh, uh, excited about JWST. Uh, ex ex excited about the uh, Rubin Telescope, which is going to be a ground-based uh, telescope. Uh, and that's going to do actually map a lot of Milky Way streams. Uh, and that would be useful for actually doing this kind of inference. 
Um, I'm also excited about there's a telescope called DESI, uh, which I'm also working on right now. And we are trying to find more streams in the Milky Way and actually uh, map them. Um, but my thesis work was on brown dwarfs. Uh, so brown dwarfs are these tiny, small stars uh, that uh, we find in the Milky Way and in other galaxies as well. Uh, and these big telescopes that are coming up are also going to revolutionize the field uh, uh, in, in, in that domain. So I'm super excited just about what's going to come up online as an observer. This, there's going to be a lot of data, and uh, we're going to have to just go through the data and hopefully find gaps, find more brown dwarfs, uh, and then constrain um, different models in astronomy. When Nancy Grace does those big, wide field shots of the sky, you'll have all these brown dwarfs in the way. Will, will you actually be able to see them in the images as it as it's taking them? Yeah, so this is uh, one thing we, we, we added as a sentence in this paper is that uh, once if you're taking an image of, let's say, the, Androm the halo of Andromeda, in the foreground, you have the Milky Way uh, halo in disk and so forth. So uh, along the, your line of sight, uh, so you might get some brown dwarfs there. You might get any red faint stars in there. So um, the that would be useful. But we know how to discriminate these stars from something that's like in, Andro in, in the galaxy of Andromeda. So we can actually just remove them by their colors. And uh, yeah, but it's not always a good, um, you know, we're going to have some contaminants, basically. And in this paper, we simulate those contaminants. Uh, so our simulation are assuming we have this contaminant between us and the, and the stream that we're observing. Right, right. So in this case, the, the brown dwarfs might actually be contamination to the observations yeah. that you're trying to make. But we might get a much better census of, you know, as we get tons and tons of images, as they start to build this big picture of the whole sky, we'll get a much better census of how many of them there are around us in our vicinity of the Milky Way. Yes, yeah, and uh, what I did with my PhD work was uh, we're using HST. So HST has these surveys of high shift galaxies that they're looking out in, in the galactic plane, and in the in the foreground you have a bunch of brown dwarfs that are uh, um, you know contaminants to this survey. I guess one person's contaminant is another person's treasure. <laughs> right, uh, absolutely, yeah. So my job was just to go into the survey and find all these tiny brown dwarfs and we're able to say something about uh, how many of them there are and how they distribute it in the galaxy. So Roman will, will do the same kind of, uh, uh, when it, whenever it's observing something extragalactic, you have a bunch of foreground stars and especially brown dwarfs because they're so faint, so red. So we might be able to actually get a better idea of how many of them there are. It, it really is amazing to me. I mean, we've already experienced this with JWST, but with all of these new telescopes coming online, both on the ground, and we didn't even talk about um, the extremely large telescopes. Like, there's so many that are coming out yeah, that yeah. that it's a good time to, to be sort of starting your career in this field because finally there's going to be a lot of telescopes <laughs> yes, they, to fight yeah. over. Yeah, yeah, this is amazing. There's so many facilities, so it's a, it's a great time to be... Uh, an observational astronomer. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, Christian, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today and good luck with your research. You just only got like three more years to wait before you get time <laughs> on the telescope. Yeah, thank you so much, Fraser, for having All me. All right. Appreciate talk it. to you later. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Christian Agonze. Now, I'm going to talk some more about my thoughts, but first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Hey Twyla, Dougie Stewart, Stephen Krasaki, David Richards, Mark Anstis, Joel Yancey, and Tony Lofilar, Dustin Cable, Vlad Shiplin, Modzo, George, David Gilson, Andrew Gross, Jeremy Mattern, Josh Schultz, and Jordan Young, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. When I look at the comments and feedback on my YouTube videos, there's a lot of kind of just eye rolling, you scientists made this dark matter thing up, yawn. And anyone who has been following this convoluted story of dark matter for as long as it has, you know that this is not something that people would make. Nobody ordered this. Nobody wants this. <laughs> but nature just is more complicated than we ever could imagine. And there are so many independent observations. And yet still, this mystery has remained. And so... Now we get this entirely new set of telescopes designed to help try and figure out this problem once and for all, or at least bring down the constraints even more. But when you set out 
trying to solve a mystery, when you explore, you don't know what your destination is. You don't know where it's going to lead you. And it might be that the problem is really easy and it didn't require much to solve the problem. Or you might spend 10 years, hundreds of years, thousands of years. You never know about where that answer is going to be. And that is exploration. And so hopefully this next round of telescopes, Vera Rubin on the ground, Nancy Grace Roman and the Euclid are the ones that are going to help us get a much better answer to this question. Or maybe we won't. Who knows? Again, as always, I'm enjoying the journey. Now, if you want to hear another interview about a different capability of Nancy Grace Roman, its ability to detect exoplanets, I've got another interview that you're going to want to check out. All right, we'll see you next time.